I'd like to introduce all of you to Richard Martin, my friend uh, and World War II veteran. Hello. 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 Hi. Now, Richard is here with his son, Greg Martin, and his grandson, Jeff Martin, who is also a military veteran. So everyone wave, say hello to Greg and Jeff as well. All right. Hi. So in our um, WSUE 102B course, uh, Innovations of World War II, we're learning all about the inventions and innovations from the war. And this week, we're specifically learning about the B-29 Super Fortress. And Richard happened to fly on a B-29. And so today, we're going to ask him about his experiences. And he's going to tell you some pretty amazing stories. And I'm excited for you to hear those today. Um, so Richard, can you tell us... Um, were you drafted into World War II or did you volunteer? I was, I was drafted. I was just a little 18 year old and wham, they grabbed me. You, so you were drafted. They didn't you didn't give me time. Yeah, so you didn't have a choice. No, didn't have yeah. a choice. March 43, I went in. Okay. Now, where were you living at the time? Were you in Wichita at that time? Yes. Yeah. I was in Wichita. You, so I've been in Wichita all my life. Been in I'm Wichita all here. your life. Okay. Okay. And so when you were drafted, did you get to pick the branch of service that you joined? Oh, they just slapped me in the Air Force or the Air Corps, they called it then. We didn't have any Air Force. It was the Army Air Corps. Oh, the Army Air Corps. So the Air Force didn't exist yet. No, that was years later. Years later, okay. Do you recall your first days in service? Do you remember? Oh yeah, hey, I went to Port Leavenworth. I did all the, hey, the old man had us doing was cleaning the grounds, I think, the parts and whatever. But we were only okay. there three days. Oh, so you went to Fort Leavenworth just for a little bit. And, yeah, just and three you had to days. clean the grounds. Just for yeah, three days. Miami Beach, Florida for basic training. Okay, so what was Miami Beach like? It sounds lovely. Was it? No, we were, they had a golf course and we did all the training on the piano and ruined the golf course by the time I got there. It didn't look like a golf course. It just looked like a training field. Oh, so you didn't really get to play golf. You, you went for training. Oh, yeah. I like to play golf, but that golf course is not existent for them. Oh, goodness. So what all did they have you do during basic training? Well, we did, usually they take us out that golf course and we do a, what they call extended order drill. Mm -hmm. They have you running and then they blow a whistle and you dive down into the dust because it was dust by then. And uh, what I remember particularly was one time we had a, a retreat parade and the guy, we got back late, and the guy said, hey, you folks are not going to have time to take showers. You're just going to have to put it on your suntan and be back here in eight minutes. And some of them went back to the room. They said, I'm not going to do that. And they just went in and took their showers, and we went down there, and there was about half the people there, and half the people were taking showers, and we just closed ranks, and away we went. Oh, goodness. <laughs> that wasn't much time. That was just the way it was. Uh-huh. Do you remember some of your instructors from when you were there? No, but I remember mail call. We had a guy. They they called mail call from A to Z. And this guy it was a Polish guy. And the, the guy that was having that the mail couldn't pronounce his name. And this guy only got a bunch of mail. So when he got down to the W's, he just hung up his his name was Warsakowski. He was oh. from Ohio. And uh, he just hold up Warsakowski's mail and he'd go up and get it. He oh, always so got a lot of that. <laughs> so it's hard to pronounce his name, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. So did you get a lot of mail while you were there, while you were in service? Well, I, uh, I was uh, dating my wife then. And 
we wrote, she wrote me every day and I wrote her every day. That went on for years and years. Oh, so you each wrote each other a letter every day. Every day. Oh, but did you receive a letter every day? How how fast was the mail? No, the mail. Hey, sometimes you get no mail and bang, you might get five or six letters. Who knows how it works? Oh, sometimes wow. Yeah. A uh, and she wrote me when I was overseas, and I this letters were spasmodic over there. I'd write her every day, and yeah. and I'd get nothing and nothing, and where I'd get a bunch of them. Wow. So our students today, you know, have texting on their phones. And yes, so well, that was a long before <laughs> our time. <laughs> Gosh, I don't even understand texting. Oh, I bet that was so hard to wait for a letter to come. Oh, hey, and then when you get letters, you, you get a bunch of them. Mm. But hey, I read them and reread them. I was yeah. dating my wife. And yeah. So at what point did you get to see your wife again? So you were off to basic training. How long was it before you got to see her? She came out to California once mm -hmm. and I saw her. And uh, of course, then we got married while uh, I was stationed in Harvard, Nebraska, big metropolis of 250 people. It's not a very big Obviously place. I'm trying to on the map now. Oh, so you two were able to meet there during the war and get married? Yeah, we got married. Oh, gosh. And we got married before I went overseas. And oh. that was pure accident. Because I, uh, what happened, we had to fly uh, 10, 3,000 mile missions, and we had good weather and got it in. And all of the Officers were married, but me and everybody's wives came from all the United States because they were going to see their husband for the last time. And so they got there, and we had time on their hands, so they decided, Oh, I'm going to go to Chicago. I said, Well, I'm not going to sit here in Harvard, Nebraska, and everybody's in Chicago. So I came home. I didn't even know I was coming home. And then I got married. Well, I was a surprise. I'm on Friday, married on Monday. Woo. I didn't even know I was coming home. That happened real fast. <laughs> yes. But I guess you had to because you didn't you didn't know where you were going to be sent next, right? No, I didn't then. So when you were, is that when you went to California? Oh no, then I went to Duquesne, Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, and went to college for a number of months. Okay. Okay. Uh, so tell us what you did. Then I went to Marysville, Tennessee. Uh -huh. And in Nashville, Tennessee, you took a, a series of tests, lasted three days. And when they got through the test, they classified you as a pilot, bombardier, or navigator. Oh. So what did you get classified as? As a bombardier. And uh, if you had, a, if you're a bombardier, you had to go to the Western Flying Training Command because that's where they train bombardiers and navigators. Wow, so you had to take a test and then they told you what you were going oh, the, to do. This lasted three days. And the last thing was talking to a, uh, a psychologist. And you know what he asked me? He asked me if I like girls. That's it? That's all he asked you? Uh, yeah, well, he asked me a bunch of things. That was the last thing he asked me. Oh, goodness. You like? So I guess he must have had. Some boys that didn't like girls. I have no idea what they were doing. Oh, really? I just That's interesting. That was a question on the test, but they told you oh. you're gonna be a bombardier. So can you tell our students what that meant? What kind of a job was that? Well, we had a Norton bomb site, which uh, when I first got it, it was a no secret thing because in the, in those days they didn't think the Japanese had it, but by the time we got to doing bombardier training, they they figured the Japanese had the northern, so it wasn't quite so secretive. Yeah, so you got to use the northern bomb site. Wow, we've we've learned a little bit about that in our class. That was top secret at first. Well, we, I, I bombed a unison with my. He happened to be my best friend. He was a radar operator, and he would kill cores, and then he would call outside angles, and I would 
synchronize the bomb site based on his information, and then that would just automatically drop the bombs. Mm. We had, uh, we were, uh, uh, all the wings ahead of us had uh, uh, bomb doors that just ground open real slowly, but we had compressed airs, and ours would open in a matter of seconds. So wow. we would just open up doors just before the bombs dropped. Mm-hmm. We'd be on the bomb run, and the bomb, well, the bomb runs on a Norton run about 40 seconds. But on that APQ-7 radar set, they'd run four to five minutes. So they always set us up so we would fly from one land point to another land point, and we were always going across water. So we, uh, that was going to keep the opposition down. Okay, so so your aircraft had those automatic doors. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, they, that... I mean, they were air compressed, and they would open in just a matter of seconds. Yeah, yeah. I didn't... So, and we'd make sure a bomb you... run with the door shut. And just oh. before the bombs would drop, I'd hit the switch, and the doors fly open, the bombs would fly out, and I'd hit the switch, and the doors would fly shut. What a, what a good invention. <laughs> I'm sure that invention helped you a lot. Uh, I'm going to share the the schematic of the B-29 here so our students can see it. So when you were in the plane, remind me where you were sitting in the B-29 as the bombardier. Very nose. In the tip of the nose. Okay. So on our schematic, it's... uh, Right on the nose, so numbers one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, right there. <laughs> okay, and so that's where that Norden bomb site was at that you used. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so looking through that, that's what told you when to press the button. Well, right? the Norden bomb site actually triggered the dropping of the bombs. Okay, okay. So then so there, was, I, there was an industry that, uh, that, that, killed what they call rate. And when those two indices met, the bombs automatically trained out. And we trained them out and dropped them 35 foot intervals or 50 or whatever you wanted. I don't know who did all that. I just did it. Yeah. So how are you trained to be a bombardier? Did you have to go to special training? I mean, and I was, oh, it took months and months. And I, I remember I didn't do Oh, I, I did blow, but I had one mission where I had two 500 footers and a 600 footer, and I actually swear there was something wrong with the bomb side, but we had three bombardiers, and the other guys got normal bombs, so I tried to get mine thrown out. I never could get it, and you had, they had a curve, which was called 215, mm-hmm. and you had to get below the curve, and hey, I was sitting at about 230 for a while, but we mm-hmm. finally started flying at night. And I went up one time and got a shack and 250 footers, and that was the first time CE got below 215. Ooh, that took a lot of work to, to do yes. that. Yeah. So you just had to keep dropping them, and the closer you got to the target, you got the better score, right? Well, we, we would drop three bombs at three different targets, three different directions, so you had different wind uh, speeds, cost speeds, and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So then um, when you were dropping bombs, you mentioned you got better at night. So what was the difference yes. between day and I did night? Better, well, I think the reason why I did better at night, hey, the, the air was still, it was like flying on glass. It was really great. Wow. And that's where I started getting some decent bombs and finally got my CE down so I could graduate. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of physics involved in in dropping bombs. Well, I guess you're right. Mm-hmm. I just dropped them. I never thought about all that. <laughs> you just had your job to do. That's right. But now, a ten man crew, isn't that something? A ten man crew, and you'd be dropping bombs for well, uh, uh, before I got radar set, in only forty seconds, you'd be on a bomb run. Uh, hey, then, then we were running about four minutes, probably. Yeah. Now, now talk to me about radar. How did you use radar during all we of used this? Radar, uh, we used radar 
for our navigation, and they had a different kind of thing. And then we used radar uh, by Norton bomb site in conjunction with an APQ-7 radar set. We had a radar man, and he was on the radar set, and I was on the Norton bomb site, and together he and I dropped the bombs, and he happened to be my best friend. Well, that was convenient. Him. Yeah, you probably really had to have good teamwork and good communication skills to... Well, when, when you were dropping bombs, there was just nobody on the intercom, but me and the radar mm. man, his name was Paul. He happened to be my best friend. Oh, yeah. So he was your best friend, huh? Yeah, he died about a year ago. Oh, he lived I'm in sorry. Georgia, yeah. So you stayed in touch with him after the war. Yeah, we well, we went to Bomb League reunion, and I met he and his wife, and my wife and I, we went to Bobby, oh, 15, I'd say, and yeah. uh, then his wife got breast cancer, and she mm -hmm. couldn't come, and then she passed away. Well, that's Then sad. Paul came sometimes by himself. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got to still stay in touch with him up until, up until the end. That's fantastic. Yeah, he, he died one year ago. One year ago, okay. Wow, that must be really hard. Do you remember all of your crewmates from this time? Oh, I guess I do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you were able to stay in touch with your best friend. What about your other crewmates? Did you stay in touch well, with- Well, I saw the Union in Washington, DC, and a bunch of them came. And I had some friends and another crew, and they came to more reunions and. Some of my people did, but who knows oh. how that worked. Yeah. Well, here, let me show a picture of your plane with, or at least let me show a picture of your crew first. So the students can see oh, it. Oh, that's them. And there's, my, there's Paul right there. Which, can you tell me, is he on the top row standing or on the bottom row sitting? Top row. I'm on the far right, and he's standing next to me. Okay, so you're standing on the far right. Right. I, can I can tell that's you. Paul's next to me. <laughs> and so he's right next to you. So his name is Paul. Yes. Okay. And see, I thought he was so old and mature because he had a college education. He was married and had a son. And hey, I was a young kid that had nothing. Oh, so. so I got you... Yeah, so you oh, really yeah. looked up to him. What was that? You said you really looked up to him. Oh, yeah. Hey, I mean, I thought he was, well, to me, I, he seemed old and mature. Yeah. And he was. We flew our first mission, and, of course, he was an atheist, and he had all kinds of problems. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I guess Greg wants me to tell you the story. He, uh, he, he was in the back. He was in the back of the front of the plane. He called me up, wanted me to come back and help him, and I had a uh, flax suit on and all kinds of heavy junk, and so I got up out of the bombardier seat and I struggled back there, and there was Paul, and that's on but a pair of shorts and undershirt, and he's pouring water out of a canteen on top of his head, and he said, what were you doing when that kamikaze was chasing us? And I said, I was praying. He said, that's my problem. I don't have anybody to pray to. So when we got back to Guam, I went to the tent, went to sleep. Paul disappeared. And he went to the Catholic chaplain, the Jewish chaplain, and a Protestant chaplain. And boy, he never changed. He he stayed close to God from then on. Wow, what an experience to to drive well, hey, that. I, I thought he was such a mature guy, and I really looked up to him. And until we flew that first mission, I couldn't believe he wasn't a, a, somebody I could be lying on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So tell me about um, some of your other crewmates. How old were they? Were they very young? Were they all older like Paul? Well, let's see. There was one guy younger than me. Uh, here he is, Warner. Warner. Warner was a year younger than me. Uh -huh. Everybody else, I think, was older than me. Oh, yeah. So and what I was, was the younger boss of the crew? Yeah. So what do you think the average age was? Of your crew? Well, let's see. Uh, Baker was about 24. Mm -hmm. Don was 21. Jim was 
he must have been 27 when we had the gator. Yeah. And we had our tail gunner was, oh, he must, I, he must have been upper 20s. I don't know how old they were. <laughs> they all looked young to me now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I ask because a lot of our students are in their early 20s, and I wanted them to imagine themselves in your position. What, what well, I was 20, and this guy was 19. Oh, okay. Now, now, I know there's a story about your 20th birthday. Can you tell me that story of where you were on your 20th birthday? Well, what was happening, I was flying my first mission, and we took off. I was 19, and we landed, and I was 20, or maybe it was 20 and 20, but I don't even remember. It was 1943. Uh-huh. Oh, shoot. I was probably... 20 and 21. Yeah. But hey, we were young, young, young. So young. So you took off and you were 19 you, when you landed. Yeah, I landed, I was 20. I think you I, were 20. No, I think maybe I was, well, what's, what's bad is when I got married, I had, I had to get my parents' permission and my wife didn't. And that really upset me. And oh. I was irritated. I think maybe I lied about my age. I was a couple of uh, months before I was 21. Oh, so you had to get parents' permission? Well, in theory, I was supposed to, but I didn't do it. Oh. I just, like, <laughs> I was two months from being 21, so I just told them I was 21. Oh, goodness. Well, and you ended up being married for a very long time to your wife. How many years were you married to June? Oh, how many years was it? 60. 67, I think. How many? 67, I think it was. Six. She Almost died, 70 years. She died in 2002, mm-hmm. I think it was. No, 12. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was delightful, for those of you who won't get to meet her. <laughs> uh, she was what? I said she was delightful. Yes. Mm-hmm. So... Um, let's, um, so let's talk about when you were in the air, uh, you were in the Pacific theater. Right, we flew from Guam to Japan and back. Took about 15 hours. The last mission we flew, we went to, uh, and all we ever bombed was oil refineries. And mm-hmm. our last mission was to, to Suzuki Minoto, and it was north of Tokyo, over on the Yellow Sea side. So we had to fly across Japan and up the Yellow Sea to this oil refinery. And then we heard later on that while we were going across Japan, the emperor was trying to uh, sign uh, a surrender. He had signed it, but he had hit it. And these guys during the middle of the night were trying to get it because they, the military people didn't want to surrender. So when we went across Japan, they had to black out Tokyo and they couldn't find the emperor. And so they ended up getting to go ahead with their uh, surrender. Of course, that was our last mission and the war ended just, oh, well, I think on the way back, we got over with Iwo Jima and radio operators and hey, the war is over. Wow. So you were Iwo in the Jima, air. Yeah, we were in there. We were on the way back and we were over Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is about halfway between Guam and Japan. Mm-hmm. So, so your missions were all from Guam to Japan and back. Right. Okay. Okay. And so then you would do bombing runs on those missions. Yes. yes. And the okay. bombing runs, well, they, they always had us when we were going to, from landfall to landfall. So we were flying over the water. Yeah. Except when we went to Kawasaki, which was a suburb of Tokyo. Yeah. And it was... They had, oh, they had get their 60s first lights and black and ACAT going all the time. It was a, but I had a friend of mine that was, uh, his name was Ed May, and he did, they took somebody swiped his plane, and so he didn't get to fly the first five missions. So, and they were most what we call milk runs because we didn't have any opposition. Well, then we went to Kawasaki, that was the suburb of Tokyo, and hey, they had ACAT and search lights. And this was his first mission. So when the plane zeroed in on a target, he saw all this 
searchlights and stuff, he thought they were heading towards the wrong target. But of course they were. That was that was the way Tokyo was. Yeah. Wow. What a first mission to have. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was, uh, he was on the ground interviewing people, getting somebody to say, take their plane for the first five missions. And so yeah. I flew and he just interrogated people. And then mm-hmm. he got on the next mission and that was the one to Tokyo and he got his eyes opened. Oh, goodness. <laughs> now, now I thought it was interesting. You called you called some of the the missions milk runs because there was well, no milk runs because uh, we didn't have much opposition. Okay, and so uh, that's what we were uh, that's what we were experiencing the first few missions, and then we went to Tokyo and it was a different story. Yeah, yeah. So, what kind of opposition did you encounter when you were in the air? Well, primarily, primarily flat. Uh, the uh, Japanese had what they called Betty bombers. They were twin engine bombers and they would just fly along beside us in parallels and they would radio to the ICAP people what our ground speed, what our airspeed was, what our altitude was, and what our direction was. And that would allow the uh, people who were shooting the ICAP to get a little more accurate. Wow. Wow. Now, what were some memorable experiences you had up in the air over Japan. I remember a story you told me once about a kamikaze. Oh, that was the first mission. Okay, that yeah, was the first got, mission, okay. Yeah, we, we missed our landfall and we were going up a bay towards Osaka, but we didn't know it. And the navigator took her over Japan and the radar operator had half his scope out and all he's picking up was water. And of course we were going up this bay. We didn't have a clue we were going up this bay. And then the tail gunner calls and says, hey, there's somebody on our tail about the size of a cigarette butt, and you, and it looks like a cigarette butt. Of course, we were flying along, not doing much, and this thing was getting bigger and closer. Boy, pretty soon he was like a dime, and then he was like a penny, and then we started going into evasive action, and, mm-hmm. and it took us, well, we finally found out that a B-29 with four engines could make a tighter turn then a bomb with a couple of wings on it. Okay, so we wow. Finally lost him. And then when we lost him, we were over Japan. We didn't have a clue where we were. And I don't know how the radar operator found out, but he found out where we were, got us to our initial point, and we made our bomb run and dropped our bombs on the target. It was wow. a miracle. That's kind of scary <laughs> to lose your way like that. Yeah. Yes. Wow. And then um, talk to me about refueling. So if you're flying from Guam to Japan and back, did you have to stop and refuel anywhere? Or could you do We that? did, but occasionally okay. complain if they had problems, they'd keep up with their, their fuel and they would land the Iwo Jima and refuel. But we always got back to Guam. Okay. You know, we didn't have, well, I remember one time we were coming down the runway landing and the plane in front of us landed and they started to taxi and they they ran out of gas and and somebody had to come out and, you know, and put them in their taxi place yeah wow that that would we, be we always we always had enough gas i know maybe our engineer and our navigator they did a good job uh with our fuel consumption yeah because they probably had to calculate that to know oh yeah they were and another thing we, my radar operator was uh, a celestial man. So whenever the navigator wanted a celestial fix, the radar operator got up in the uh, dome and took the celestial fix. Of course, I didn't really know what a celestial fix was. I yes. still can't believe that you can take a fix on these couple of stars and draw a couple of lines and you know where you are. But they did it. That's amazing. You can navigate by the stars, even in an aircraft. Yeah. I don't, we didn't do that very often. We usually used radar, but once in a while we'd have to use celestial and you'd go up in that dome and get a fix. Wow, as long as it's not cloudy. <laughs> Amen. Uh-huh. So so you mentioned, you know, you were in the air when you heard that the war was over. What happened next? Well, we were coming back from, we'd flown our last mission and it took us 
17 hours and 15 minutes, and we were coming back over Iwo Jima, and the radio operator was on the radio, and he said, hey, the war's over. And that's how we found out. Yeah, so what missions did you do after the war was over? Did you... Oh, we do a POW job. And that was oh. a, that was a fun one, because we, uh, we flew at 1,000 feet. Of course, I'd never been over Japan at 1,000 feet. And the Japanese gave us the POW um, coordinates, but they were they weren't right. So we got over to Tokyo Bay, and we had to start hunting for the POW camp. We ran wow. up and down. It took us a while. We finally found it, yeah. and uh, we went over the camp at about a thousand feet. And as soon as we opened the Bombay doors, all the Japanese that were on the ground, hey, some of them even ran into Tokyo Bay because they thought we were gonna got bombs on. Of course, we were just going to guys the POW camps. And the yeah. POWs, hey, they were waving arms and legs, looked like they had a bunch of them. And uh -huh. they were screwed up to get supplies. And some of them was laying on the, in the compound. Some was laying in the bomb wire fence. Some was laying outside. But yeah. hey, by then, they were running the camp. And they'd go outside and get the things and drag them in. Oh, so they were running the camp at that point. <laughs> yeah. So then, so your mission was to drop supplies to them. To the, I mean, we flew, flew over a thousand feet, which uh, we never dropped. We always dropped bombs from 15 to 20,000 feet. And here we were flying just a few days later, the toast of war was over. And it was, but I, I didn't really know for sure who it was. Yeah, I don't know if we have any. Um, any uh, general aviation pilot students in our audience. Um, last year, we had a student who was a pilot and he couldn't believe that you flew at 1,000 feet. That is so low. Hey, well, we a... were dropping flies from POWs and that's just what you did. Wow, boy, uh, but they were- They were so thrilled because they weren't getting anything to eat and they, they, they just, they were waving everything they could wave when we fly over. It was oh, great. I bet they were so excited to see you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I, so, I, I looked at them, I remember they were waving arms and legs, and it seemed like they were waving everything. And of course, they didn't have much on the way of clothes, and they, didn't, they weren't getting fed right. So they were thrilled to see us. Oh, how what a special moment to remember. Yes. For sure. So then after that, what did you do afterwards? Did you stay in the military for longer? Did you end your service? How did that work? Well, uh, they, they gave us a choice of staying in, but if you stayed in, you had to stay on Guam. So I, I didn't want to stay on Guam, so I got out as soon as I could. But hey, it still took me eight months to get out. And then I had to come back on a boat, and that church weeks from Guam to San Francisco. Wow. Wow. So you had a long wait to get yes. back home. Yeah. But by the time I was on the boat, I was on, at least on my way. So I, I felt good about things, even though it was going to take a long time to get to yeah. the USA. Yeah. So did, did they reassign you a new job since you were done being a bombardier? What did you do no, next? I, I got out. Right. Right, right away. I went yeah. from San Francisco, Leavenworth, okay. and they just charged me bang, bang. Oh, man. Now, I remember at one point, and maybe it was during your basic training, I remember you telling me a story about uh, canned peaches and how you had to serve in the mess hall. Yeah, was well, that... we, we had to get a ground job, and so I was his mess officer, and then they started sending people home, and pretty soon I was running the whole mess hall. And of course, I was a bombardier. I knew nothing about running the mess hall. And I remember when we, we got all these, we got, we couldn't get any fruit, but we could get cans of peaches. So we had canned peaches for months. Oh man, do you still, do you still eat canned peaches today? Well, I've changed them, but I, I guess it's not my favorite thing. <laughs> You're done with canned peaches. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Man, make you run a mess hall. That's a, a very different oh, job. 
and it, yeah, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And yeah. I, I, I was just the assistant. And then all of a sudden, that guy had enough points, and they shipped him home with a whole bunch of people. We had about 200 people in the mess hall. And the, the thing that was crazy, my cooks were uh, uh, radar repairmen. They didn't know a thing about cooking. And we had these gigantic kettles of food. Oh, it was a nightmare. Me and a oh, bunch no. of great participants feeding 250 people. Whoa, you had to learn real fast. Oh, yes. So how was the food while you were there? Did you like the food? Well, some of it was fair and some of it was not. But hey, you just, whatever you got to, well, I tell you what was bad. Some of our food came through Accra, and that was the naval depot. And they would take the best food. And by the time it got to us, they'd already taken anything. We, we very rarely ever got any decent cuts of meat. We got, I think, uh, we got some sheep from New Zealand one time, Ooh. mutton, and yeah. that didn't do a thing for us. Oh, we no. Mutton. Not, not the best cuts of meat then. No, that's a bummer. So, um, what are some other um, things that happened to you before you finally got home and were out of the service? Any other memories you have? Well, what I remember is I was well. We we were lived in tents for a while. And I sure a tent was my radar operator, and uh, what I remember. Specifically, see the island of Guam is full of rats, and the rats are about six inches long, or maybe eight, and their tails were about that long. And there were thousands of them all over the trees. And one time, uh, we were trying to go to sleep, and uh, the guys next door in the tent were having a big drunken party, and they started shooting rats with their 45s. And we woke up the next morning, and we had three holes in our tent. Well, I, radar operator Paul was really mad, so he went down to headquarters, and everybody had to turn in their 45s. Oh, that was no. The of, <laughs> yeah, and then, I think that was thousands of people turned in 45s, all from those guys shooting holes in our tent. Oh, man. I bet I'm, I'm really glad you guys weren't heard in that. <laughs> well, hey, oh, Paul was the one that took the initiative. I mean, we yeah. woke up there, he's up. Yeah, boy, he went down to headquarters and ready to ruckus and everybody turned in their guns. Those must have been really big rats. <laughs> yeah, why they were. Hey, they, they, and they took over, they had Guam under their control. And these rats were only oh, six or eight inches long. And then their tail would be another six or eight inches long. And they, they just lived in the trees and there were thousands of them. You, you just lived with rats. We finally got into the barracks and yeah. uh, I don't know how the rats got in those barracks, but if they get one in, we would kill it. But one night we had a half a dozen of them in there and we were running around at two o'clock in the morning throwing GI shoes at these rats and we couldn't get them all. We finally just gave up and went to sleep, turned out the lights and I was laying there in my bed and yeah. I felt this dead rat calling up on my bed. So I kicked, and I guess I must kick just right. He went straight up in the air and came right back down my bed. So this time I kicked really hard, and I built a shell at the end of my bed. And yeah. I kicked that down still and kicked it clear off. And oh. I remember there were, there were times that we finally just had, we, we couldn't kill all the rats. We just let them have the bears. Oh, no. So you had to live with the rats. In the barracks. We usually, usually got rid of them, but one time we had a problem. We just finally went to bed and let the rats run around the barracks. Oh, man. And they, were, and they were big things. Oh, my gosh. I never saw a rat that big before. They Ooh. must have grown them fifty for Guam. Well, you put up with a lot. <laughs> oh. oh. Hey, what, so when you. One time what happened, uh, they were building the trees out in the back of our barracks. Mm -hmm. And so they were dynamiting. And 
to get into this coral. And uh, we had gone to the mess hole to eat. And we came back from our chow, and there was a big hole in the roof, a big hole in the floor. And and I said, uh, the dynamite so much rock had just went through the ceiling and the floor. When we finally got the ceiling fixed. We never did get the floor fixed. So we put a little panel over and put a screw in it, and we would sweep our, when we'd sweep around our barracks, we'd open that thing up and sweep the dust down, and then we'd close it. <laughs> Nobody ever knew the wiser, huh? <laughs> oh. oh, goodness. Well, that's one way to make lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you about that. We came back from, uh, on the way back from the mission, uh, the radar, the radio operator's responsibility was to check the bomb bays to see that all the bombs had dropped. His name was Henry. So I, and I would, when I would come back, we'd be about 100 miles off of Japan. I would just routinely check the bomb bays again, even though he had checked them. So I came back there one time. I looked in there, and there was three bombs hung up. I said to Henry, did you check the bomb bay? He said, yes. I said, how was it? And he gave me the AOK sign. I yeah. said, well, take a look at this. And he looked around the corner, and he couldn't believe his eyes because there were three bombs hanging out. So he and I went out in the Bombay. Of course, I'd been to Bombay before, but I'd never been to Bombay at night at 18,000 feet, climbing 200 miles an hour. And so we were out there, and we were going to go one, two, three kick, like the conga line. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't know how much of the kick it was going to take. Well, Henry got too excited and kicked early. And by the time I kicked, all the bombs were gone. I was just kicking out in the thin air. Oh, no. How and, scary. Like, you could have fallen out. <laughs> yeah, I, what I remember is I've been the bomb. Uh, I've been in the bombs all the time. But I've yeah. never been there at night at 20,000 feet when it was dark and the wind was blowing like a gale. Oh. So that was a different perspective. Woo, I bet that made your heart drop. Hey, yeah, when they opened the Bombay doors open, you know, in just a second or two. And yeah. we got all prepared and said, okay. And they opened the door and boy, the wind rushed in and practically blew us out. And, and we had this prearranged signal and Henry got all excited. And mm -hmm. kicked, we didn't know it was going to take a little kick or a big kick. Yeah, maybe anyway, you kicked too hard. He got, it went. He got and somewhere between, somewhere around Iwo Jim is where we got rid of him. Wow. So they just, they just got stuck in there? They didn't release? Well, yeah. They, they, in theory, they did. All I remember is going back and putting the pins back in the tail. Mm -hmm. So in theory, that's what armed the bombs. Mm -hmm. The bombs would drop in that little propeller on, and the propeller would rotate, and it would rotate out. And that allowed the bombs to be armed when they were mm -hmm. in the plane. In theory, they were they weren't armed, but when mm -hmm. we uh, took the pins out and the wind was blowing, we didn't know whether they were armed or not. But at least wow. we got rid of them. Goodness. Uh, here, let me show a picture of your plane before I forget. So the students oh, okay. see what your naked. Plane look like. Oh, yeah. That's it. So tell us the name of your plane. My Naked. And we named it that because um, everybody was putting girls, half standing fat girls on the side of the plane, and we decided we weren't going to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, when you're in the service, if you somebody says something that's kind of stretching a point or far-fetched, we'd say, my naked ass, and that was just a common phrase, so yeah. we named our plane my naked. That's and every time we paint a duck and a bomb on there. <laughs> a duck without feathers? Yes. Is your is your duck I'm, naked too? <laughs> yeah, most of that, most of his yeah, feathers are blown off coming down. Oh man, I notice you've got uh, little bomb symbols underneath the windows. We put one of those bombs at the mission, and then we painted a duck for each one of those missions. So oh, I'm not I sure. See. Oh, there was eleven when that picture was taken. Okay. And our wing flew. Our wing flew fifteen missions, but we didn't fly fifteen. They started out the first mission. They had twenty-eight planes, 
yeah. the last mission we had a hundred and forty one. Wow. Okay. Now, so the the nose here, where all the windows are, that's where you would have sat. Yes. Uh, yes. And my mom's side was right in the nose, and and I was right behind the mom's side. Okay. Well, that's really neat to see a picture of your aircraft that you were in back in nineteen. 19- yeah. We had a 10 man crew. Uh huh. Yeah, good crew. We could be so, like 10 people drop bombs, but that's the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, was that a small crew or a large crew? That was a normal size crew, Tim. That's a normal size. Okay. Okay. Now, after the war was over and you finally got back home um, with your wife, did you go back to school? Did you do a different career? I ended up in a trade. I was going to go to college, but I never did. And I ended up, but I did like a trade. And I did go in. And I spent my whole career working in accounting for mm-hmm. manufacturing company. Yeah. So you went to accounting. Now, did you do taxes? Is that right? Yeah, at some point, but it was yeah. really primarily. I counted in prior to taxes, okay. although I did get involved in taxes later on. Yeah, but yeah. I still do my own. You still do your own taxes? Yes. Oh, that's oh, fantastic. Last year, the last year I went to a, I had a pub, so I went to a, a gal and she helped me, so I don't know what I'll do next year. I oh. may go to her and that's okay. That's okay. It's that's fantastic. You have, are still doing your taxes. And how old are well, you? I, do, again? I used to do about three or four a year. I did that for years and years and years. And finally, I decided, my uh, gosh, uh, uh, I got to quit doing all these for all these people. So I gradually cut down until oh. I was only doing the phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have someone who can help you with the taxes. They're pretty complicated. Well, I went to a tax preparer last year, and that's yeah. the first time I've been to one. Okay. Okay. That's all right. That's all right. I remember you mentioned last year you you had even helped Greg with his taxes, too. Yes. <laughs> He's probably not afraid of throwing the towel for that. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so you had a very long career in accountancy um but at the same time you still kept your connections with your old crew and your old friends and, and you mentioned well we used to have bomb wing reunions ah okay and, uh, mm-hmm. and we did that for a number of years i think we have 15 or 18 i'm not sure and uh, paul my best friend yeah. uh, Brady, I said, he and his wife came yeah and my wife and i came and then Paul's wife called one time mm-hmm. and said she was sick and she wasn't going to come. And three days later, she called and said she was going to come, yeah. but she couldn't be as well. And that when we had a bombing union in Orlando, and she died two years after that. Oh, that's tough. That's yeah, very that's sad. Yeah, that's that's very. And sad. then finally, we finally kept, got Paul to go in again. He was going by himself. Oh. One time the other. Washington, D.C., and I got my two boys to go with me, and yeah. we were going down different airports picking people up, and all of a sudden, we went to the front airport, There, old Paul was getting on the uh, tram with us. Well, it was good. great. To... And well, my he had, he had vision problems at the yeah. last in that generation, and wow. so my boys kind of took care of him when we went through the line to eat. Oh, that's so good. That's good. I'm glad you stayed connected. Um, so did you, um, well, tell me about how did your experiences in the war, how did that affect the rest of your life? How did it change your outlook or behaviors? How do you think it affected your life? I don't know that it affected me. I, I mean, I remember getting a job after the war and, and that was kind of the problem because I I wanted to get in the time, but I didn't have any entire experience. And that was the thing they kept asking me. How much experience do you have? Well I had none. I thought, my gosh, am I going to get to work in Italian or not? But I finally did. Good. 
that's good. That's good. Now you mentioned that uh, you've gotten to go in a B-29 since the war. Uh, I noticed okay. your hat. Your hat says- How many months ago was A year ago? Probably a year ago. Yeah, Greg says about a year ago. We, yeah. have a, we have a beach here in Wichita called Doc. And Greg or somebody got me on that thing. And we went up for about a half hour and flew around the city. I hadn't been up since February of 45. Wow, what an experience to get to fly again. Yeah. Yeah. So when you I flew in dock. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Of course, at that time, that was the best. Hey, that was the best thing you had. Super Fortress. We had uh, a full bomb load was 40 500 pounders, which is 20,000 pounds. And we started out carrying about 32. And every mission, they would decrease our gas and increase our bomb load. They keep Ooh. the weight of the plane high. Well, we didn't like the fact that they were cutting out our gas because we, well, they were gallant, we thought. So, but they kept doing that. About yeah. the fifth mission, they cut, they finally had a full bomb load and the lowest amount of gas that we had used. And that's yeah. how we flew. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, what was it like to be? In dock, did they let you sit in the bombardier seat again? Yes, I, I oh. flew in for a half hour. Wow, that crazy? that's so fun! Well, I haven't been in a 29 since February 45, and Greg got me in that flight and he went with me. Wow, so over, over 75 years, is that right? Did I do my math right? Well, you're probably right. I'm 96 now. When we did this, I was 95, so I guess that was, yeah, 75 years I go up to 29 again. I'm glad they got one that flies. Yes, they put a lot of work into Doc. I'm sure they did. And it was probably a lot of money. Yes. Now, I guess it cost a fortune to fly, but he, he must have put the bill I did. Uh, someone from church. Oh, somebody from church did it. Yeah, I, I looked at those tickets. I thought maybe I could take my whole class on a flight on dock until I saw the ticket price. <laughs> so uh, we'll what, how to... much was the price? I don't know. It was in the thousands. Um, for oh all my... of us, it would have been several thousand, yeah. So, but we'll all just right. go to the museum. <laughs> 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 How many students have you got there? Oh, here they well, are. In our, yeah, About we've here? got quite a few. Mm -hmm. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Gosh, they all look young, young, young. They are you young. young. Well, thanks. Um, <laughs> But they have done a great job learning all about the war and all the inventions that were made in the war, including that Norden bomb site and the B-29. And they just learned about Doc this week. Well, that's great. I'm glad they got to, to know about it. I mean, it's a, I'm just glad they got a, a 29 flying. That amazes me. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Richard, are have there any other... What? Have you been on Doc? No, I have not yet been on Doc, but I hope to. Well, I hope you get to. Uh, it's, it's quite an experience. Yes. You may I'm not want to try to roll my career up late. <laughs> I'm glad you got to go. How fun. I am. I enjoyed it. Good. Good. Did they get pictures of you in Doc? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, he did. I would love to see one. So, Greg, you'll have to see. Oh, I said I'd yes. love to see a picture of you and Doc. Oh, uh, I will get those two. <laughs> oh, thanks, Greg. <laughs> okay, so um, Richard, I had asked the students to think of questions to ask you. They're very curious about what it was like for you as a 20 year old to be uh, dropping bombs out of a B-29 uh, over in the Pacific. So they have questions and I'm gonna open it up and let them ask you questions. Are you ready? Okay, that's fine. 
Okay, so uh, Kate, whose microphone isn't working, uh, she uh, had a question. Uh, she said, uh, you know, what was your job after the war and how was adjusting afterwards? Well, it was kind of rough getting a job, but my job was in accounting, and that's what I did the rest of my life. Yeah. But getting my first job sure took a time. I remember everybody took asking you how much experience you had, I had none. Yeah, so you really had to find someone who was willing to take a chance on you. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah, and so how was it adjusting? I went to work at a oh. Kaiser Fraser dealership, and those okay. days they said Kaiser Fraser was going to run Ford General Motors and Chrysler out of business, but it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, that's too hey. bad for them. But they, but, and they were trying to the Fraser was supposed to be a, a front wheel drive, and the engineers couldn't solve the front wheel drive problem. So we, all we ever got was a upgraded Kaiser, and they called it a Fraser. Oh, <laughs> so that that didn't make it very far, did it? No, and see, in theory, they were going to run Ford, General Motors, and and everybody out of business. And yeah. Shoot, I don't know how long they produced Kaisers, but it wasn't very long. Yeah. I was so, there a few months. Uh huh. Was it hard for you adjusting back to civilian life? Well, it was hard to get a job, but yeah. because hey, everybody wanted experience, and they you know, all I had experience was jobs and bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for answering Kate's question. Uh, I have a, another question from a student named Chance. Um, Chance, do you want to ask this yourself or do you want me to do it? Where are you, Chance? Okay, I'll do it. Uh, he says, uh, Richard, did you fly in the B-29A-BN or the B-29B-BA? I think it was the B. Which one? So oh, we, the, the had, we had commercial planes because we had no guns on our plane. Okay. Except okay. Tail gun. And in theory, that was supposed to make us fly higher and faster, and the Japanese couldn't get us. Well, so all of our practice missions were at 30,000 feet. And then we got to Japan and we flew at 15 and 18. We never flew at 30. Okay. Good to know. All right, Chance, thank you for that very specific aircraft question. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, let's have Kaylee go next. Um, what are your thoughts on our modern military? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. We're, we're so advanced. It's probably beyond my comprehension. I think they're doing a great job, but they have all kinds of technology that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even when you started, you got to use the most advanced technology they had, like the brand new plane. Oh, yeah. we, the, our radar system that we had at that point was all, we were the only wing that had the APQ-7. And that allowed us to pick up the difference between water and land. And all the Japanese had their own refineries on the coast. So it worked like ideal for us because we could pick up all refineries and drop our bombs. Okay, okay. Kaylee, thank you for that question. Okay, let's have Garrett ask his question. While you were at um, camp, what did you guys have to entertain you while you weren't doing any work? Well, we had movies, and uh, the movies were outdoors, and you, uh, and you had, didn't have a clue what was going to be on. You just went to the movie and saw whatever they had. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, Bob Hope was doing his shows then. I think one time he came where we were. But that, that was, I just, it happened so fast. I'm not sure I remember very well. Yeah, so, so you might've gotten to see Bob Hope too. I think we did what? Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. Hope and Jimmy Durante, did he come with him? I, that's so long ago, I, I have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. 
Lots of big entertainers. Well, Frances Langford was a woman, and of course, we, had, we didn't see any women over there. Oh, they had a few nurses. And yeah. one time I was up in the uh, hospital, I got, uh, I don't get pneumonia or something, and I was in for three days. And the thing I didn't like about it, I was supposed to take medication so often, and these dog nurses were involved with the uh, people that were in the hospital, and I had to go up to the nurses to say, hey, it's time for my medication. That's the only way I got it. Woo. I was in the hospital three days. So. And while I was in the hospital, uh, uh, the crew flew a, a, a shakedown mission to truck, so I missed the shakedown mission, and my first mission was to Japan. Oh, so you missed your first mission because you were in the hospital? Yeah, I was in three days. I couldn't believe that they went to truck while I was there, but they did. Well, that's a bummer. The the Japanese still held, and when we flew to Guam, we had to detour around truck because the Japanese still held it, and they had the manacac, and they'd shoot at you if you flew over. Yikes. Oh. So we, we just went around truck. Yeah. Okay, Garrett, thank you for that question about entertainers. There are some pretty good ones. I'm glad Richard got to see a few. Um, Tyun, would you like to ask your question next? Uh, what was your life like before you joined the Army? Well, I was so young, I don't think I... Uh, I hardly... I think I'd, I'd gotten out of high school and gone to work or a can come in, bang, they drafted me. Shoot, it happened so fast you didn't hardly know you were doing anything. Wow, so you, you did graduate high school and then they drafted you? Yeah, well, I got drafted in 1943. How old was I? 18. 18. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tyune, thanks for that question. Micah, would you please ask yours? Did you ever drop any incendiary bombs? You mean a wall of flying? Yeah. Well, one, one time, I'll probably, maybe I've told you this. And I'll tell you, we uh, had a routine deal where we went back and looked for uh, bombs that got hung up. And uh, we found three that hadn't uh, been dropped, and we had to go out and kick them, kick them out. Of course, I didn't know hardly what I was doing, but we kicked them out and got rid of them. Yeah, yeah. So the bombs that, that your plane dropped, what did those bombs do? Were they... Well, we dropped different kinds of bombs, but the biggest bomb that we had was 4,500 pounders. Yeah. We had two bomb bays, 20 in the front and 20 in the back, and we would pull the pins to arm the bombs. Yeah. And of course, we got out to that one time we had three bombs, well, we put the pins back in the bombs, and we didn't know whether they were armed or not. We just kicked them out somewhere in the Pacific Ocean before we got to Iwo Jima. Yeah, I bet that was scary. <laughs> what I remember, see, we had a, a plane one time landed, and they hadn't checked their bomb bays, and they had three bombs left, and they didn't find out about it until they hit the concrete, and they started putting the brakes on, and out in front of the plane goes, three bombs scooting down the runway. Oh no, did they explode? No, they didn't explode, but they, I don't even know whether, I don't know whether they're armed or not, but all I know is uh, Whoops. they were ready to rock us from then on. They said, hey, you gotta check your mom made, which we always did. Yeah, yeah, you really had to check that close. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, hey, it was just a routine thing. Uh, the radio operator did it, and then when I got back, I did it again, and mm -hmm. and hopefully the voice gunners were doing the same thing, and, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we happened to have three of them got it hung up. That wow. Changed the perspective. <laughs> Micah, thank you for that question. August, would you go next, please? Um, did you face any mechanical errors while flying? Did I what? Face any mechanical errors while flying? 
I think maybe August might be thinking about the engine problems, maybe the those mechanical errors. Talk about the engines on the B29. Well, we have four engines, and we, uh, if you had any engine problem come back from Japan, we didn't have, but some yeah. crews did, and they'd have to land at Iwo Jima. Oh, well, I remember a friend of mine that uh, was coming back, and they had lost an engine, so they started to land at Iwo Jima, and on his approach, he lost another engine. Oh. So he was really, really flying. Woo, that's, that's scary. Uh, now, Doc, the B-29 that's been restored, does it have the same engines as yours? Yes, yeah, it's got the same engine. Well, you know, it's got brand Oh, yeah, he, Greg just told me it's got newer engines and it's got more oomph than we had. Yeah. Ours were 29, ours were 29 50, and I think these were 33 or something. Yeah, so I think yeah, Doc has new engines that are better. Yeah. Right? I, I think we were really a little bit underpowered, and they were always talking about getting bigger and stronger engines, but they never made it. Yeah, Not yeah. Huh. So one of our students, uh, Chance, he mentioned uh, maybe they didn't get the engine upgrades until Korea, till the Korean War, because they were still using the uh, probably true. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, well, yeah, better in we did. Yeah, I'm glad that yours, your specific aircraft didn't have engine problems. That's good. Well, we did. Uh, well, we had, we had a good uh, engineer. And of course, we had a, there were five people that were on the ground crew. And they they just babied our plane. And that's oh. what we did. Yeah, yeah. And okay. one guy that was a crew chief ended up as a preacher after the war. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's a career change for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions that we'll ask you. Um, Eduardo, would you please go next? Do you ever miss flying? Uh, do, you do you ever miss fly? flying? Do you ever miss flying? No, I don't think I did. <laughs> no? Flying <laughs> fly now is completely different than flying back then. Mm, completely different, yeah. yeah. But you did enjoy flying in dock. Yes, I did enjoy that. Okay. We were okay. up on a half hour, and hey, it's just, hey, I couldn't believe I was in it again. Yeah, yeah. All right, Eduardo, thanks for that question. Fearis, will you please ask your question? Are you, are you able to type it? Oh, is okay. Here, Richard. Fierce wanted to know: Is there anything that you regret during your career? You meaning during his? Oh, I know. I'm just glad I came back. Uh -huh. Yes, we're glad you came back too, for sure. But no regrets on anything. No, I don't. Uh, yeah. No. I was the young. I didn't have time to have regrets. Uh, no time to even have them. Okay, Fierce. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have had all of the students ask questions. Did I miss anyone? Oh, Jeremy, last but not least, please ask your question. Um, I was wondering, what was your like favorite moment or memory from serving during World War II? Well, I guess my best memories are some of the friends I made on the crew. Mm -hmm. You fly those missions and you really get close to one another. And I, I ended up with uh, a great friend and my radar operator. We kept our friendship up long after the war. Oh, you became like your own family. Yes. And he, we had a bombing reunion in Wichita one time, and he came in, his, but then his wife had died, and he came in and came to our house and got to meet all my family, which I was glad he got to do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Jeremy, thank you for that question. So technically, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for your service and all of that. So, Oh, thank well, you, thank Alexis. You <laughs> okay. Well, um, that 
is all of the questions our students have for you, Richard. Um, I would like for all the students here to please unmute yourselves and give a round of applause to thank Mr. Martin for his service in answering all of our questions. Hey, I'm just glad to be able to do it. I'm yeah. glad to do it. Okay, well, students, if you will, please um, all unmute yourselves, say goodbye to Mr. Martin, and then students are dismissed. So Richard, don't leave yet. All right, everybody wave bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Richard, is this your first Zoom? Am I first? Yes. This is your first Zoom? That's awesome. I don't even know, I don't even know what Zoom is. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you're <laughs> you're brave and willing to experiment with us and try something new. Zoom is beyond me. <laughs> <laughs>